All right, this is gonna be an overview of the Radionics D6500 security receiver. This is a central station receiver used to receive events that are transmitted from alarm systems over the phone lines. So this is the second receiver that Radionics Inc. produced. So first one being the D6000 Omega alarm receiver up here, which I did dem a demonstration on previously. And the third being the Radionics D6600 right here, which is still very much a new receiver, yet it was discontinued just pretty recently actually. Uh, these support IP reporting and all that, but now we're gonna go over the 6500 receiver. In terms of hardware, it is a 4U piece of equipment and very long, as you can see here. We have eight Toco line cards installed. We have the CPU card and the power supply card, and we have a printer over here. So in terms of LEDs and the line cards, the top LED, which is red, which I'm actually gonna increase my brightness so you can see this a little bit better. That indicates that there's a trouble on the line if it's solid. So if you unplug the phone line, that'll become solid and generate a trouble event. And it also flashes every time the line card is pulled by the CPU. The ring light below it lights up whenever the phone line is ringing. And we have this button here, which has two lights on it. The one on the left is green and that indicates the line card is online or busy. And it flickers as data is received from the panel. The one on the right indicates a listen-in session is active on the line card, and you can press the button to either select it for listen-in, or if you are already having it selected, you can press it to cancel the listen-in the listen -in session. On the right, on the CPU card, the top LED is the system LED, and that lights up whenever the internal event buffer is almost full. So if your automation system and your printer are not keeping up with the events you have coming in and the buffer almost is full, that'll come on. And the... PNTR LED comes on whenever there's an issue with the printer. Over here on the power supply card, we have the AC power LED. That's solid when AC is present and it flashes when AC is not present. Uh, so if you have a power failure, that'll flash. Battery light is on whenever the battery is low or missing. And I don't have a battery installed, so that's on. We have the silence button on that power supply card. That silences the internal buzzer. We have the test button on the CPU card and that generates a test event. Uh, right above it, we have the talk button, which was for the listen-in, which they were going to implement two-way voice on this receiver, but they released the 6600 before they got that finished. So those, the talk button and the microphone jack do not work. However, in terms of listen-in, there's the speaker, there's the jack to connect headphones and a volume control. Listen-in is supported. On the printer, we have this little switch here, which sets whether or not the printer is enabled. And over here, we have a switch that selects the operation of the spool down here. So this printer prints uh, from the blank paper here, goes around, and gets automatically spooled back up. If this switch is in the middle, it automatically spools it as it prints it. Uh, you can flip it up, and now it will not spool at all, so you'll have to manually wind it. And you can also push it down momentarily to force it to spool. This paper is the silverized paper that older equipment used. Not entirely sure how it works, but it, uh, it's not thermal and it doesn't use ink. It effectively burns it into the paper with electricity. You'll see the little print head is in there. Um, in terms of receiving events, I'm going to be demonstrating it with a Radionics 9412 panel, which I have set up. And we're going to be sending in modem 3 format. This receiver supports pulse formats and it supports modem 3 and modem 2 and BFSK. Um, on the older line cards, that's all the formats you get, but on the newer line card, the D6541, that also adds support for DTMF formats like Contact ID and Ademco Express, FBI Superfast, ScanCom, formats like that. Um, I have first line cards here, lines one and two, those are 6541 cards, the rest are 6540s. So if we go over to the receiver, or not the receiver, the panel over here, this is a Radionics 9412, which I have set up in here. Excuse the mess. That's what I'm gonna be using to demonstrate sending reports. I have the receiver set up so that the buzzer only activates whenever an alarm or a trouble or any other exception event occurs. Otherwise, the buzzer will be silenced and the event will just be processed silently. It's in automatic mode. Manual mode operates just the same as manual mode on the 6000 receiver does. So let's go ahead and send a test report by pressing command 41. And I will let you listen to the phone line as it sends that report. There we go. 
So you saw that it printed it automatically, displayed the event on the display momentarily, and you heard the modem 3 reporting. Modem 2 and modem 3 were both implemented with the 6500 receiver, and modem 3 is one of the more superior formats now. It was the first one to introduce sending of the zone text or the user text that's programmed into the panel to the central station. So, that was just a test report, which buzzer did not sound because it was not an exception event. And while I'm at it, I'll show the test button here. So if you press this test button, it will generate a test event just internal to the receiver, which shows up as account 0888, test zone 8. Just like that. And now, unlike the 6600, where you can just view it from memory, if we wanted to look back in the log, we'd have to look at the actual printout here, which doesn't show up very well on camera. So now what I'll do is I will arm the system over there and then set it off. So let's go ahead and arm the panel and wait for the exit delay. And we'll watch the event come in on the receiver. So you'll notice this will come in as a closing report. It will send area one and I think ID either one or two and it'll show my username. Closing report, area one, ID one, my name. And that was very fast modem three reporting. Now if we go back over here, and I'm going to set it off by opening the door and then not disarming it in time. It says disarm now, we're just gonna leave that. And we will get the alarm report and the restoral report. an alarm. I have that zone programmed to silent bell so the keypad isn't going to scream. And we have it. You saw that was uh, sent the zone name, alarm report, and a restore report. And the buzzer activated because that's an exception event that doesn't just get logged. That would actually sound the buzzer because it's an alarm. Now I'm going to go ahead and cancel that and disarm it. One alarms, bedroom door. So that's the same zone text that got sent to the receiver. Now it's disarmed. And we will get the cancel and the opening. Cancel alarm, that's my name, opening report, and the expanded data. And you notice when it sends an expanded expanded data for a report, it shows plus 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 the account number, then the expanded data. And that's just like how it shows it on the 6600 receiver, because they kept it the same across multiple receivers. So now um, let's get into programming. So you program this receiver off of the D5200 programmer, just like most radionics equipment. And you can actually access the programming jack by opening this. So here's all the line cards, and here's all this stuff, and the ribbon cable. Two LEDs there, those indicate the transmit and receive lines on the automation serial port. And we also have a switch to switch the AC power on and off, and the battery. And if I increase my brightness, you might be able to see it. Yep, there's a little toggle switch up there, which is also used to set the date and time from the front panel. And you can't see it, but there's a little RJ11 jack in there, which will plug our, plug our programmer in there. Oh, face my wrong way. Right there. Let's hook this and get this closed. That's kind of annoying. It's fine. All right, so now we'll get into programming. So we'll turn the programmer on and get logged in. Really hard to do one-handed. Now we're gonna use the 6500 handler for this purpose, as expected. And to get the receiver into programming mode, you have to hold the silence button and press the test button. Now you see, it goes to program, programmer ready. And it does not process events or take calls when it's in programming mode. 
but the ring LEDs will still work because those are connected straight to the line, they're little neon bulbs. So there's two records that this receiver uses, there's MPU and line card. So if I go to MPU, which this configures all the parameters for the CPU and the printer and just generally how the receiver operates. So what I'll go ahead and do is copy that on the receiver. And now we'll go ahead and just go menu by menu. So start with global. First thing first is receiver number. This is the number to identify the receiver when it's sent to automation. Then we have armed status. That determines whether or not the armed status of a 6112 or 4112 panel prints at its test time. So those panels sent the whether or not the system is armed to the receiver when they send their automatic test report. This determines if that prints or not. So if you're not using that data, you just set that to no. And next we have auto ACK. So if that's set to yes, it's in automatic mode all the time. If it's set to no, it's in manual mode all the time. And even if you're in automatic mode, if all your reporting devices are failed and the receiver cannot, like if all your primary and secondary reporting devices are in trouble, it will drop to manual mode so that you do not lose events. So we have buzz in auto, that is set to no, and buzz alarm. So these two work together. If you have buzz in auto set to yes, even if it's in automatic mode, it'll buzz for every single event. And buzz alarm, if you have that set to yes, it overrides the buzz in auto function and forces it so that the buzzer comes on for any event that is an exception event. Now, busy second reports. So line cards, can be assigned to groups. So if you had, say, the first four lines on one line card group and the second four lines on another group on separate telephone numbers, um, and all four of them were busy, that indicates that no more calls can be taken on that group. So a busy seconds report effectively determines, it measures how long that group or individual line is busy in a 10 minute period, and if it's over 10%, it'll generate a busy seconds report. I think that's a UL thing, but you can disable that if you're not using it. And call blocking. So you noticed as events were reported to the receiver, it printed and displayed them live. If you have call blocking enabled, which is how it is by default, which is annoying, um, it will wait for all the events to come in first, then print them all in one big block. Point slash user text, that determines whether or not the receiver actually prints the zone or user text that's sent on modem 3 format. So if you're not using it, you can set it to no to save paper. Time set enabled, that enables setting the date and time from the front using that little switch that was internal. Time set report, that sets whether or not the receiver is going to generate a report for the time being changed. Power supervision and reports. So um, you notice it doesn't show any trouble for my battery being low or missing. That's because I have this set to no. If I had that set to yes, it'll generate a report and show a trouble on the display for any condition where the battery is low or restores, and same with the AC power. Next option, receiver number. Okay, so done with that menu. Now, I was talking about line card groups, so this is where you assign which line cards are part of which groups. You can have up to eight groups within the receiver. So currently I have line card one set on group one and all the others on group two. Line card supervision. So if a line card is unsupervised, that basically means it's disabled. The receiver is never gonna get any events from it because it's not pulling it. So if you're not using line cards, you set them to no in here. Internal printer sets the configuration for the internal printer. So this printer right here. Uh, we have two options, device and supervision. So these two options will show up in every reporting device. So device basically indicates how it operates. So we have four options. We have primary, secondary, always on, and always off. Primary indicates this is a primary reporting method. So if you had an automation system connected, you would set it to primary. Secondary indicates is a secondary reporting method, so it'll only get events sent to it if all the primary devices have failed. Always on indicates the receiver's gonna send events to it no matter what. Always off means it's disabled and it's never gonna get events sent to it. Supervision, so if that's set to yes, the receiver is supervising that device. Otherwise, it does not. So if my printer ran out of paper and it was set to no on this option, it would not generate any report or trouble condition. 
That's the internal printer. The external printer configures the external printer, as you would expect. It's got a DB25 on the back for an external serial printer. So we have the device and supervision options, which those will be common across all of them. X on slash X off determines whether or not the external printer is capable of using those X on slash X off characters for uh, flow control. CR slash LF, so that appends a LF character to the end of every report, but if your printer automatically line feeds after a carriage return, you'll set this to no. Parity determines whether or not you're using parity on the printer, so you have no, even, or odd. Now it sets to no. Baud rate is the baud rate. Data bits is the data bits. And back to device. So automation configuration, we have output format. That's set to 6500, so there's either 6500 mode or SIA mode. And on really old revisions of these receivers, it also had 6000 mode to emulate the automation output of the 6000 receiver out there. So we either have 6500 or SIA in the new ones. Uh, device and supervision, same as usual. Group reporting. So if you have group reporting set to yes, it'll report the line group. So if you had lines one through four assigned to group one, and a report came in on line four, it would come in as group one if you had group reporting set to yes. Otherwise, if you have it set to no, it reports the line number. So that's yes or no. BFSK fire bit. So BFSK reports, same with modem two reports, can differentiate between fire and non-fire events. So that was the thing with older reporting formats. If your automation software did not support uh, having an event show as a fire event based on what the receiver sends. You would set that to no so it doesn't send that special event type. Modem 2E fire, same thing except for modem 2E format. SIA fire restore, I believe that is similar where it sets whether or not a fire restoral is sent as a regular restoral or as an actual fire restoral. And ignore the printer noise, that's the 60, that's the 6600 processing events. We got computer configuration, so that's 7P2, so 7 data bits, parity enabled, 2 stop bits, that's the default radionics config, and that's also what Sims uses, so that's what I have it set to. We can also have 8N1 and several other different configurations. I'm going to leave it at 7P2. Computer parity, so that sets what type of parity it'll be. It'll, it'll be either be even, odd, zero fixed, or one fixed. Baud rate's the baud rate. Handshaking, so that can be either ACK or NO. So if you have it set to ACK, the receiver expects a acknowledgement character back from the automation system after every event. Otherwise, it'll just send it and assume the automation system got it, assuming that um, hardware flow control is still enabled. NAC character and ACK character, so you can customize what those values are if you needed to have them different for your software. Trailer character, that determines the uh, the last character in a 6500 mode output, you can change what that character is. Automation weight determines how long the receiver waits after sending an event to the automation system uh, before resending it or assuming it's in trouble. So if your system was slower at processing reports, you could set that time higher. 6500 header character, that's usually disabled, which it is right now, but if your automation system required a header character for 6500 mode, you could enable that right there. And input commands determines whether or not the receiver responds to commands sent to it from automation. So you can set the time and date and determine which line is selected for listening and a few other things, I believe. So if you wanted that disabled, you could set that to no. And link test, if that's enabled, uh, allows the receiver to send a heartbeat packet to automation on a periodic basis. So if in your automation system, if you ever saw the receiver stop sending that, you would know that that's one way to supervise whether the receiver is working or not. Packet separator determines whether or not a final packet separator will be sent in uh, SIA output mode. If you set that to no, it'll just close it with the closing bracket character. Subsubscriber determines whether or not the SIA mode will ex um, include like subdata, so like which card a user used to access a door and access control and back to output format. And that's all the MPU options. Go back and we'll go line card. So we hit enter group. Actually, wait, let's receive it first. So when we do receive, uh, it's gonna ask receive from line card. Now, 
This almost implies that it's gonna receive it from particular line card one if I set one, but this is actually gonna receive it from a group. So you set the line card configuration based on the group. So all the line cards in group one will have the same configuration that you send to group one. And all that is stored in the CPU card, so if you hot swapped a line card, it would automatically get the new configuration value sent to it from the CPU. So we're gonna actually receive it from line card group number one. Now first is act tones. So this sets your the order of which acknowledgement tones are sent on the phone line, which I'll let you listen to that, but first is modem 2E slash 3A2. Uh, dual tone is the two-tone handshake used for contact ID and a whole bunch of other DTMF formats. 2300 hertz and 1400 hertz, standard pulse handshakes. Modem 2 and modem 2, the reason I have that in there twice is because Radionics recommends that you send it twice in a row. And tone duration is setting how long the pulse acknowledgement tones are. So 10 is one second. Now you can also set end of table, which that makes it stop at a certain value. So if you only wanted one act tone, you'd set uh, number two to end of table. Set that back to mode in two. So now I'm gonna call the receiver on a phone so you can listen to those acknowledgement tones in order. Oh, I gotta take it out of programming too. That probably help. There we go. Since it didn't get any data, it just hung up the line and didn't generate any event. I'll put it back into programming mode now. Okay. So that was the acknowledgement tones, phone supervision. So currently on my second line group, I have this option disabled, but line slip, or line slip, line sniff determines whether or not the receiver actually supervises the telephone line. So if you have that set to no and you unplug the phone line, it will not generate a trouble event. Now, pulse errors, the receiver is capable of sending expanded data for, um, if you have a panel reporting in pulse format and it doesn't get through for whatever reason, it'll actually send you um, out the printer and to automation, special data indicating uh, what the last digit received and what kind of error it was. If your automation system doesn't report, doesn't support that, you can set it to no. Auto answer ring count, I have that set to zero. And uh, if you had special equipment on the line back then that captured caller ID data, because this is before the receivers were capable of doing it themselves, you would set that to a higher value so that it, it, it would actually let you capture that data. And that's back to line sniff. And line formats. So this determines how the receiver interprets an event based on the number of digits it sends. So this applies to both um, DTMF and pulse formats. Five digit is set to three plus one checksum. That can also be three plus two double round and four plus one double round. Uh, six digit is set to four plus two double round. This can either be that or three plus two checksum. Yeah. And I'm gonna keep it at, oh, it's also got four plus one checksum. Keep it at four plus two double round. And eight digit, that doesn't apply to pulse. It only is for DTMF. That determines whether or not it is four plus one express. So that's the Ademco express format or DSC 4 plus 3 checksum. We're gonna use 4 plus 1 express. Timing adjustments, so this lets you adjust the different timing parameters for the line card. So the ACK wait is how long it waits um, after sending an acknowledgement tone before going on to the next one. So if your panel was slower at sending data after it hears the handshake or the ACK tone, you would increase this value so the receiver doesn't move on to the next one uh, before your panel sends the data. And 30 is meaning it's set to three seconds. Round wait is how long the receiver will wait before, um, for another round of pulse digits to arrive before interpreting the report. So that would be, I think that's, let me think. I think that's 4.2 seconds in my case. I'm trying to remember what the multiplier for that one is. 
Modem time is an option you shouldn't have to ever change, and it was never documented, but what it does is, is it changes um, on modem three and modem two handshake tones, it has the modem carrier there for a little bit of time before sending data. That changes that amount of time. So if you increase that value, it'll sit idle for longer before actually sending data. And you shouldn't have to change that, as I said. Three plus one, 10 cycle. So 10 pulse per second formats are obviously a lot slower than 20 and 40 pulses per second. So this is for pulse. If you have this set to yes, the receiver actually measures the pulse width of the um, data it's receiving to determine the speed. So uh, sometimes you'll have to set that to yes for it to actually properly decode 10 pulses per second reports. If you have it set to no, it relies on the other timing parameters, which I'll show you. Pulse plus percent and minus percent, those were also undocumented and I haven't figured out what they do yet. If I were to take a guess, it would determine how long a tone has to be present or absent before it's considered present or absent to avoid uh, noise on the phone line from causing falsing. Digit threshold, so that is how long the receiver waits for another digit to come in. And 10 is one second in my case, so that determines how long it waits for another digit before interpreting the signal. And back to ActWait. Next thing is listen in. So listen in is that feature where it can uh, connect a phone line to a speaker and keep it off hook for some time after the panel sends a report so that you could have a microphone on site listen in. So duration sets how many minutes that this is, that it stays online for listen in after it receives an alarm. Um, this is set to one minute in my case, but it is overridden if you're using BFSK or modem format, that's determined in the panel. Now, obviously not every single account is gonna be using listen-in, so what you do is you define a block of account numbers that uh, use it. So my starting digit is B and my ending digit is F. So accounts B000 and B00 through FFFF and FFF are set up for listen-in accounts. Now if, I said, now if I set that to B and C, it would be B000 through CFFF and B00 through CFF. So it lets you set which block of accounts you're using for listening. Refresh is an option used in modem and BFSK formats. That allows the panel to actually send a refresh packet to the receiver, which I haven't gotten that working yet, but what it does is it lets it extend the duration again. Now you can limit how many times a panel will do that, and that's what this option does. So this only allows the panel to do it three times before the receiver just hangs up the line. That prevents a malfunctioning panel from permanently holding up the line. And back to duration, I think that's all. Yep, that is all the programming options. So then you would go ahead and hit send and select which line card group you want to send that to. But that is all the programming options in 6500 receiver. And the one other thing I wanted to demonstrate, which I'm gonna to have to change the MPU config for this. Oh. MPU, receive. What I'm going to do is disable the buzzer for this purpose. Okay. Now, now it'll be silent. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just show you how fast modem three format is, cause that's one of the things that was implemented with this receiver. Previously um, on the D6000, you were limited to pulse formats and BFSK on newer revisions. Mine is too old for BFSK, sadly. I need to get it upgraded at some point. Um, but modem two and modem three were developed and the 6500 was what originally added support for those formats. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna pop off the, uh, this terminal block here, which has my SLC and all my data buses. So it's gonna send a lot of events and I'll just let you listen to how fast that is. If I unplug this, plug it back in. Silence it, now come over here. Let you listen to the line. There we have it. So that was a lot of events, as you can see. 
And you see that it buffered it because this printer is not as fast as how fast the panel is able to report it. And there we go. So that kind of demonstrates how fast modem reporting format is and how the internal buffer works. So if your printer isn't able to keep up and you're receiving a lot of events, because obviously this can process modem three format, which is really fast as you saw on all three line or all three, all eight line cards at the same time, your printer would never be able to keep up. So that's why it's important to have a buffer in software. But that's my overview of the 6500 receiver. If you have any questions, just let me know. And yeah, that's it.